And we are starting in three, two, let's go! My name is Frey, I'm your mouse Cecil Sensei, welcome to the stream today, welcome to the video. If you're watching this in the past, present, or future, welcome, welcome, well, actually you wouldn't be watching this in the past, that's physically impossible. But, before we get started, a little background on myself. I am a long-term D&D fanatic, not long, long, long-term like the people who've been playing for 20 odd years, but I've been DMing for about six years now. And in that time, I have used a plethora of different tabletop RPG systems. I've used a plethora of different world settings. I've DM for dark fantasy, fantasy, high fantasy, low fantasy, uh, cyberpunk, modern day, alternate universe, modern day. Um, gosh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've lost, I've lost count. Do you know, I've, I've been a player, I've been a DM. I've been, I've been, I've done it all. Um, I've always kind of been a story writer. Always created stories. Always, I've always been known for, um, specifically my world development. Every dungeon master has their own strengths and weaknesses. My strength has always been world development, world creation, uh, NPC creation and such. Um, so hopefully, uh, I want to spend today uh, imparting some of that knowledge to you guys. I'm trying to show you guys different tips and tricks that you can use to maybe... How do I even describe it? Okay, yeah, let's just straight up on the nose. Let's make an anime themed world. Let's make it together. Um, this isn't going to be a... This isn't going to be a big, like... Um, like, how do I describe it? This is going to be a very high-level creation. I'm not going to be going into, like very specific details because every anime is different anime is a very very big genre there's a lot of different animes there's hundreds of animes maybe even thousands of anime and to say that you could use this method to make every single genre and every single type of anime uh would be would be quite ignorant of us but we're gonna do our best and to do that, I've prepared a little. I've I've got a little setup here, little setup, little little something something that uh, that that we can all use together. Right here, it's a blank sheet. Um. Right now, what I'm doing is I'm giving you guys the tools to create the world. We could do it together. We can make one together. But this is going to be more of a tutorial. This is going to be more of a showing you guys. How to do it. Oh, that's cool. I've never played a TTRPG, but I really want to. Would you be interested in being a player or creating your own world? Because I can give I can give I can give advice on both. But let's let's grab a better let's grab a better background first, shall we? Let's let's use this. I like this background. This background makes me smile. This background makes me happy. We'll grab this. We'll we'll throw on the blur. We'll make sure that it doesn't it's not too it's not too uh it doesn't take up too much. Of our attention span. There's the blur. Then we make it a little transparent. Uh, maybe we... There we go. Look, we've got a nice little backdrop now. Uh, okay, so my advice for players, very quick, is find a good dungeon master. Find a good dungeon master. Find someone who's willing to listen to you because D&D is based on your dungeon master. If you don't have a good dungeon master, you're not going to have a good time. That's just the, that is just the way things are. That is just the way it has to be. That is the way it has always been. And so we're going to making an anime world. Now this, um, this tutorial will be mainly, uh, tailored towards dungeon masters, but players will benefit from this too, because, uh, you know, Let's face it, almost every player at some point wonders what it would be like to be a dungeon master. And hopefully I can use this to help you guys. So, let's, let's get started. Let's get started. I haven't heard much about D&D. All I know is that you roll dice and hope for a good roll. I like to write too, mostly fantasy. Being a DM sounds fun. Yeah, so basically, okay, I might as well give you guys a brief overview. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons or any form of TTRPG usually involves one... Uh, player at the start, the game master, the dungeon master, and they control the world. They control everything about the world. They control the enemies. They control 
uh, the NPCs, they control the, the events in the world. That is the that is the dungeon master. The players are the second part of the adventure. The players are the most important part. If you have a dungeon, here's here's my biggest advice, chat. If you have a, if you have a dungeon master that cares more about his own story than his players, just leave that session. It's not worth playing. You're not gonna have fun. The only person that's gonna be having fun is that dungeon master, and realistically, he's not playing D and D. He's just telling you guys his story. Just leave. If a dungeon master is valuing his story more than your enjoyment, more than your character's stories, not weaving you guys in at all, not making it centered around you guys, then it's not it's not worth playing. You're not gonna have fun. You're not gonna have fun. And I know many people will disagree with me on that, but like realistically, like 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 is is it really that hard of a concept to understand? D and D is about the players. Every game is about the players. So why why is why should D and D be any different? Talking about anime, how about a little known genre of Isekai? Yeah, so allow me to... What's the best D&D experience I've had? Um, what was the story like? I will answer questions more towards the end. Uh, for now, we'll get this tutorial over over with. Uh, and then I'll answer questions about my own experience. Um, but all I'm going to say is my best D&D experience was a JoJo's campaign. Uh, Hidden Jam up there was one of my players. Uh, and it was by far the most legendary campaign that I did. A close second was the time that I DM'd for a Made in Abyss style campaign. Uh, if we're talking about anime, Isekai. Oh, also, for anyone who doesn't know here, I'm going to pin it for you guys really quick um, before we get distracted any more than we already have. And I'm going to send you guys a link to a link to a stream that I'm going to have this Saturday, which is going to be episode 4 of my Isekai TTRPG. Um, so, be sure to check out our Isekai TTRPG this Saturday. Here. Boom. There we go. So there you go. If any of you guys want to... That's currently that's a current ongoing campaign that I'm DMing for. Uh, so if you guys are interested, and if this piques your interest, then do send that over. Now, oh yeah, I love Hero. I, I love Hero. How do you make an anime world? Let's let's clear let's clear the room, chat. Let's clear the room. If you want to make an anime themed world as a DM, there's a few easy tips you got to remember. Number one, I'm gonna give you all the tips and then we're gonna go over them in detail. Number one, don't don't overcomplicate. Well, let's say do's and don'ts. Do's. Yeah, let's do do's and don'ts. Let's do a do's and don'ts section, chat. Let's do something like this, right? We'll split this down the middle. And we'll do it. We'll do a do's box and a don'ts box. How does that sound? I feel like that's going to be, um, that's just going to make things easier. It's going to make things more, it's going to make things more manageable. It's going to make things easier to understand. So we're going to have our do's and we're going to have our don'ts. Do's Right, there's our do's And over here is our don'ts Is like, is that, is that right? I, I, I don't think that's right But, uh, but we'll do our, I think that's fine That's fine, it'll do Do not have over complicated world lore. This is important, all right? Chat, you don't need to have everything uh, um, thrown. No, do, sorry. Do not start with over complicated lore, right? D anime and the anime experience is about one thing and one thing only, chat. No, you can because you can have an Attack on Titan stream. Have to leave, but I'm interested. Watch the you'll watch the vod. No worries at all. I hope I'll see you soon, Andy. Anime is about pacing. Most anime, we're not counting the big ones like Naruto and Bleach, but the majority of anime takes place over the span of 12 to 24 episodes. Anime has to be concise. It has to be 
paced well. If your pacing isn't there, and if it's dragging on, then you might as well be watching Lord of the Rings. And last time I checked, Lord of the Rings is an anime. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not crapping on Lord of the Rings. And hey, Suomi, I'm not crapping on Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is a great franchise. But it's not anime. And one of the things that makes that painfully evident is the pacing. It's a slow burn. You uncover things about the world little by little. You sort of discover more and more as, as the as the characters go through this massive epic. It's not what anime is. Anime is usually, especially with isekai, is you're thrown into the world, you meet the goddess, you meet someone, and they tell you the differences between this world and your world. Attack on Titan. You find out about, out, out about Attack on Titans, episode one. You find out about the, the town in episode one. You find out about like the, the survey cores, episode one. Right? And it might not be episode one, right? Sometimes it takes two, three episodes to really get into the nitty-gritty of anime. But anime isn't necessarily about you being thrown into a completely unknown world and figuring things out. You will usually know what the anime is about within the first three episodes. So the same should be said for this. Um, for anime world. For an anime-themed TTRPG. Right? However... Do slowly add complexity as the story progresses. So what does that mean? Well, take Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan is the perfect example for, of this. You give them the current lore. You give them, okay, here are the Titans, here's the city... There's a current issue. There is a problem. The Titans are attacking. We need to stop them. Right? But the moment the survey course sort of start to get a hang of things, and they sort of start to come to terms with it, and we as viewers start to understand the Titans, understand their weaknesses, bam! That is your time to add complexity. All right, now there's a whole nother... There's, there's Titans in the walls. There's... um. That's not really complexity, that's more of just a side event. But more so like the whole other continent. The, the whole lore about, like, sorry, spoilers, by the way. Spoiler warning for anyone who hasn't watched Attack on Titan. But, uh, so the basement, right? That was a huge bombshell. Suddenly you find out that the that there's an entire other continent. Um, you find out that there's wars being waged. You find out that they're an entire different, like, tech tree. Like, you find all that out, but... You find it out in one go. You find it out straight away. I mean, yes, you there's you find you it expands on that, but it's not this. It's not this ooh mysterious world that that like you need to really investigate to get to know. No, this is a world that you intend to fully flesh out within the first twenty four episodes, and that's one of the big things. If you do that. Honestly, if you just stick to these two like these two points, heck, even if you stick with this one point, you're going to be able to make an anime world. Because what makes an anime world is pacing. Pacing, pacing, pacing. Next, here's another do. Another big do is have focus, so focus on a handful handful of key characters you don't want to be bombarding your chat your 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 you don't want to be bombarding your players with a bunch of different characters that they want to meet and interact with you want to give them you want to focus on quality not quantity here you know what if it takes ages to add complexity without overwhelming the viewers what if it takes ages to add complexity without overwhelming the viewers but see, that's the thing, is like, then it's not anime. Then it's just, it's another epic story. It's Lord of the Rings, it's it's The Hobbit, it's Harry Potter. It's not anime, right? If you want to make an anime-themed world, you need to focus on pacing. You need to understand that anime needs to grab the viewer's attention within the first three episodes. They need to know what's happening. They need to understand what it, for example, let's take my Isekai RPG. Let's take my current RPG right now that I stream every Saturday at 2 p.m. BST. They were all brought into the world. 
um, they met the goddess at the very start. This was all off stream because I do I do one shots. I w see the fact that I don't know what Yu Yu Ho Haku show is uh, should should say everything, right? Because <laughs> remember, we're we are appealing to the majority of anime users. Uh, niche anime or niche anime, right? They're niche for a reason. Uh, maybe it's because it doesn't click with the greater anime audience. But, that, I mean, that doesn't mean they're not anime, but it just means that they don't fall into the the standard genre of what anime is, right? Um, but, in my TTRPG, the players were brought in, they meet the goddess. The god, what does the goddess tell them? The goddess tells them about the labyrinths. Um, the goddess tells them about the, the fight, the war between the old gods and the new gods. They tell them about how their world was created from the imagination of, um, of they they create. Yeah, but it it is anime. But what I'm saying is, for people who have watched, like we're talking about, we're talking about, like keep in mind Naruto. Let's take Naruto as a longer running anime. One Piece is a, a longer running. Bleach. These three anime follow the same rules. In Bleach, episode one, you're introduced to the Soul Reapers. You're introduced to the um, the, the 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 things that they fight. You're introduced to Ichigo. You understand that for some reason Ichigo is most more powerful than the other Soul Reapers. Um, by episode three, you've already been introduced to the Quincy's. You understand the you understand the political scape. Uh, we take Naruto. Naruto, episode one, you're introduced to Jutsu, you're introduced to the Leaf Village, you're introduced to the lore, you're introduced to um, what ninjas are, you're, you're introduced to um, Naruto's own ambitions and the kind of person that he is, right? One Piece, episode one, you, 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 find, uh, you figure out what the devil fruit are, you figure out what the pirates are, you know the, the pirates that Luffy looks up to. You understand the character that he is. You understand the adventure that he goes on, the quest that he's about to go on. These all happen in the first three episodes. And making an anime world means you need to hammer these home straight away. Episode one of my current RPG. They understand that the world is made by the imaginations of humans. They understand that they are created. They are being brought to stop the Great Calamity. I haven't told them what the Great Calamity is, though. I haven't told them. But I don't intend to drip feed it to them either. When the time comes for them to face the Great Calamity, they will know. They will know and they will understand very fast. Either someone's going to appear and they're literally going to be like, Ha ha ha. So you finally come. And they're going to be like, who are you? And then the thing's literally going to be like, I believe the goddess refers to me as the Great Calamity. Right? If I'm not going to do that, but that's an example. Right? Or something like along the lines of, Oh, the world is going to end if this guy this guy is freed. Right? I could throw a red herring in there. Right? They could think that that's the Great Calamity, but it's not. It's just like a red herring, right? There's different ways to do this. And in terms of creating a handful of characters, um, that's one great way to do it. Because what you do is you create a handful of characters. You, you, get the, um, you get the party involved. You get the party caring about those characters. For Jani, that's Fran. That's Ishka. For Rio, that's Mari. That's, um, that's, who else? Mari, um, he's currently hunting down the guy that killed her. Um, for Nyx, Ishka, Jonathan, Theo, um, Zeke. Um, for, who else have we got? For Mex, he's got, um, Green. He's got Alice. He's got, uh, Boris. Um, and now as far as all of them together, who have they got? They've got Theric. They've got um Zer they've got the, the blacksmith and his wife. They've got Jono the the um the waiter. They've got uh Oh Slay the, the Harpy, the mischievous harpy, right? These are core characters. You know what I mean? So basically the main point of anime is keep most of the deep lore thing discover Yes. No. No. The point is at the start. The characters need to know what they're doing. They need to know what they're up against. They need to know what the plot is. It's not just a case of throwing them into the world. They need to understand their challenge. They need to understand what makes the world different. And they need to 
it basically, they need to know everything that you as a viewer would know after watching the third episode of an anime. You have three episodes, which constitutes to about two to three hours of D&D time to sell the world to your players. So you need to work with that time constraint and you need to understand how exactly you're going to do that. With Ryo, let's take Ryo's example. What did I do for Ryo? Uh, he met the goddess, number one. He, he, he realized he really didn't like the goddess because she was kind of useless. Uh, what inspirations I take from? I'm, uh, she was a mixture between Hestia and Aqua. Hestia from Danmachi and Aqua from uh, from Konosuba, right? So obviously she was gonna be she's gonna be a mixture of wholesome and just kind of like why, why is she here? She's kind of a nuisance. He was reborn into a world. He meets his sister. He meets his parents. Understands that they are the high priest of the new god, which the goddess explained. Cool. Time skip. House is burning. He finds his father bleeding. He sends her out. He sends him out into the into the backyard to save his sister. In order to save his sister, he chooses to try to remember magic that his father taught him. He ends up he he ends up in a in a vision where there's um he sees the new god and he sees his sister. His sister is begging him not to take the new god's hand, but the new god promises that he would save his sister. He chooses to take his sister's hand, which leads to her dying. However, uh he um she tells him that he made the right choice. What does that mean? It means now the new god can't be trusted. It means that the sister, the sister's killer is still on the loose. He buries the sister. They have a really emotional uh, thing, like a kind of goodbye. Bam. That happened in that happened in an hour. Right? We covered that in one hour. So now what does Rio know? He knows about the world. He knows about the mission. He knows what his character is about. He knows what his character wants to do. Right? First three episodes. Literally. Wait, let's 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 do this. Let's make this. Let's split this up in episode. Story already deep. Rip service. Yep. But it's deep, but not in an overly complicated way. You see? It's deep, but it's about him. The story revolves around him. It doesn't revolve, revolve around him, but I mean like the lore that he's learned is about him. Episode introduction no um uh, eps one to three right so, oh yeah look so so it's like it's deep the lore is deep but i but it's not about but the main brunt of the story isn't about uh, um the kingdoms battling in the north there are kingdoms battling in the north and i have planned for kingdoms to battle be battling in the north um it's not about the dragon that's awakening in the south. It's not about the it's not about the waves that are beginning to eat the land to the east. It's not about the sun which scorts the lands to the west. Those are all there. All of those are there in the story right now. But the characters don't need to know about it. Because it's not relevant. It's not it doesn't add it it won't sell the story to them. Granted if your players are the kind of players that really like that kind of thing, sure. But, once again, anime. We're talking anime, anime, anime. How much do the players really need to know? You don't want to bombard them with too much lore. You don't want to bombard them with too much. Because they're just not going to be interested. Or, but like, they might be. But remember, we're sticking to anime plot lines here. Cool. So, here's another one. Here's another don't. We'll go on to the next topic. Right? Don't make your characters feel insignificant. But that also goes with don't make a d um if a tree falls no one to hear. Does it make a sound? Have you guys heard that saying? Stories focus around the main character. Things will happen. There. Exactly. That is it. Exactly. Firstly, your characters need to feel like 
See, the world doesn't need to revolve around them, but the story does. Do you get what I mean by that? It means, for example, the four of them exited the dungeon for the first time. The four, the four players exited the dungeon. And that was great, and they left. Who comes to rescue them, thinking that they would die? Theo, Nyx's old best friend. Bam, there's a connection. Theo takes them back to the library and tells Nyx that the headmaster went missing. Jani overhears this. Bam, there's a connection. The headmaster basically turned her best friend evil. All right, cool. Nyx then asks Theo, what about Zeke? Theo responds with, Zeke went to find his little brother, Fran. Bam, Fran is Jani's best friend. That turned evil. All right, let's keep going with this. Jani um, goes back and she's out in the woods and she's waiting. And she mentions that she found the she found like a dead body uh, whose form she took because she's a shapeshifter. That body that she found was Rio's dead sister. Bam! There's a connection. But do you see how the world isn't revolving around them? Just the immediate vicinity. Just the little tiny... That this little tiny pocket of the world is kind of aligning. We're pulling fate. These characters are connected. They're connected to each other. They're connected to some of the NPCs they mix. They meet. And that's great. But... At the same time, what is happening out in the world? They hear that the king is being overthrown. They hear that... Uh, yeah, it all connects together. Exactly, exactly. They hear different things happening. But these are passing remarks. They're not the main focus. They know that things are happening. They know that the world's still moving and still chugging along they feel like the world is a living breathing world but they don't need to know all the details right let's face it most of us don't even read the news nowadays because we're just not interested you know what i mean and it should you should take the same topic with your characters and this is where most dms fall most dms fall too much or like like focus too much on their story and they want the players to know that the fifth king of the southern kingdom Lost his number one general to the fiend, the fabled dragon who was freed out of the mountain after the dwarves uncovered an ancient tome. And after removing the tome from the mountain, the dragon woke up. And this dragon didn't just wake up. He blew up the mountain, which killed everybody in a nearby city. No one cares. No one cares about that. My players want to play their story. My players want to experience their backstory. My players want to know what happened to their dead best friend. Right? But that doesn't mean that the dragon didn't kill everybody in the town. That doesn't mean that the first general didn't get killed by the dragon. That doesn't mean that the dwarves didn't mess up again. Those things happened. And they are happening usually as a result of the player's actions or the decisions that they make. But I'm not going to bombard the players with the details. They don't need the details. Unless they ask for the details, don't give them the details. Because if they don't ask, it means they don't care. Right? And most DMs don't like to hear that, but it's true. You know? Even things are, that aren't connected can still affect if I just give enough time. When it's all, exactly. Exactly. Your players are in the world, and they are in your world. But you don't. But they don't need to know every single thing that's happening. They don't need to understand every single thing that's happening. They only need to understand what's relevant to them and what's relevant to the plot, right? So that's another don't. That's another don't. Now here's a do. Here's a do. Here's a great. Here's a great do. Right. Here's my favorite do. And this is a personal preference. This is a personal preference. You don't have to do this. But this is something that I've always done. And that I personally will always do. And that is set up 
1v1. No, one on one. One shots. With each. Oops. With each player. This is the best advice I could ever give you. This is advice that I can give you based purely on my experience as a dungeon master. Setting up a one on one one shot with each player in advance. I'm not talking a long, sprawling epic. I'm talking one, two hours, you sitting down, running them through a quick starting session. If you do that, just think of the benefits. The players are now more invested in their character. The players are used to role playing as the character before they meet the group. The characters are given a goal and an ambition. They understand what their characters want and they understand they understand what's happening. Look at my Isekai TTRPG. My players very rarely go off topic. They very rarely derail the campaign. Do you know why? Because each one of them understands their character's goals. And I didn't tell them their character's goals. They ran through their one-shots. They chose starting points. I, I let them roll for secondary professions, which would lead into their first professions. So... For example, Ryo's profession uh, was the, um, actually forgot, I forgot what role. Basically, all of them have their main professions that actually accept, uh, like affect their classes and gives them, like backgrounds, right? They have their main background, but I give them a secondary background. The secondary background doesn't affect their stats, doesn't give them any proficiencies, doesn't do anything except the set the scene for the starting story. And in Ryo's case, he got, he was, uh, he was the son of a noble. And his primary profession was a temple, a temple priest. So, what did what was his starting mission? The starting mission was, uh, he was at his house with his father, who was the high priest. The house was attacked, and he had to basically try to save as many of his family as he could. Now, granted, Rio was unable to save any of his family, but don't worry about that. That's just details. But it really anchored him into the world. It really showed him his character and he got to know his character. Because let's face it, when you're suddenly thrown into a group with all your friends, how do you even how are you even supposed to act? Because on one hand, you want to make you want to have fun with your friends. You want to play a game with them. And on the other hand, you're trying to roleplay a character. But then at the same time, how do you roleplay the character? You're kind of shy roleplaying in front of your friends because not everyone is, is an experienced um D D player. Sometimes you you and your friends kind of just go off the, off track and stuff. And you know why? It's the DM's fault. 100%. I say this as a DM. It's a DM's fault. If the campaign is derailed or you have a party of murder hobos, it's not the player's fault. It's 100% the DM's fault every single time. And I say this as a... I, I've been DMing for six years and I've been role-playing for upwards of 10 it's it's the DM's fault. Like honestly, like even even at its like highest level, it's like you kind of gotta know your players. Like if your story is compelling enough, and if they're anchored in the world enough, then they're going to they're going to want to know more. They're going to want to experience what their character is experiencing. Obviously, there's goofing around when friends are involved. And that's why you give them a chance to roleplay in private. Sort of get to know each other. Sort of show them, show them, because as DMs, we have a lot of, we command a lot of respect. What we do isn't easy. We create worlds, we create people, we create systems, we play through those systems, right? It is the DM's fault, 100%. If the player is purposely derailing the campaign, it, do you know what that means? It means they're bored. And it means you suck as a DM. So make an interesting story. You know what I mean? Like, that is that is that is just the way it works. You know what I mean? That is, I will be honest. That's just the way it works. If your players are purposely derailing the campaign, it means you bored them so damn much that they would rather watch you suffer than listen to your story. So get good. Some character just, nah. No, because here's the thing. Even overly chaotic character can be reeled in. Easily. 
all you got to do is add consequence. All you got to do is add consequence, right? And here's the thing. If the character keeps going, then it's your job as the DM to pull them aside and say, hey. But let me, let me, let me, let me clarify this. You only pull them aside if the other players are also complaining about it. It's, if the other players aren't complaining, it's your fault. If the other players are complaining, then it's their fault. I'm going to emphasize that. Because if all of the players are bored, it's 100% your fault. But if it's just one guy messing up, then you need uh, you as the DM need to be willing to pull them aside and say, Hey, because of you, no one else is having fun. Right? So for the sake of people having fun, you can either, you can either you know, start actually playing as a party a member of the party uh, or you can leave right but that's the only time the only time is when you see that your players also don't like it because remember it's about the players so don't just pull someone aside because you don't like their actions because that's the worst thing that you can do as a dm here's another don't well this one's just a general dm tip so i'm not going to put it in the anime world section here's another don't as a dm if your players do something big brain Reward it. Reward it. Don't never deflate, never kill the momentum of your players. Reward their, them for having fun. Literally, for example, uh, one of the worst experiences I had as a D&D player was when uh, this demon tried to attack me. Right? And I, as the paladin, I was using a homebrew class uh, called... Uh, oath of the well, it was it was in a Lovecraftian one, right? It was a Lovecraftian based um, subclass for Paladin. And what I did is I let everyone go through, but they weren't able to pull me out of the hole in time. So suddenly, this demon tries to attack me, and that's when I, for the first time in the campaign, use my skill, uh, which basically created a barrier around me that would it would basically thin reality. It would thin re this is what it said. This is what it said in the in the in the text. It would thin reality, preventing demons and other spiritual beings from entering. Which is big brain. That was a big brain move. That was a huge brain move. I was like, oh crap. But my DM, he was inexperienced, and he he did the cardinal sin. He rewrote the story for the sake of his story not being not derailed, but in his eyes, I guess it was derailed. Because he wanted this demon to kill someone. Which isn't what you should ever do as a dungeon master. Uh, you, you make the enemy, and whether the whether they kill it or not is part of the story. Anyway, so what he did is, oh, you thin reality. Well, the demon is beyond reality. So, he grabs you by the neck and pulls you into, and pulls you into another dimension. And I'm just like, what? What? Do, do, you, do you guys understand why that was a really shitty thing to do? Do you understand why that like completely killed the momentum of both me and the party? Because the party was all like, Oh my gosh, that's so big brain! Yo, this is amazing! And the DM's just like, nope. So the story will be set in stone without being changed for the... Exactly, that's what he did. And that was so crap. Nope, none. No foreshadowing. He was just a normal demon. He's just a normal demon. There was no foreshadowing. Nothing. That's another thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If it's beyond reality, the de he needs to hit it. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, he did it solely for the sake of his plot. Right? And that's bad. <laughs> Don't do that. I st I'm still, so to this day, chat, that was three years ago, and I'm still salty about it to this day. <laughs> like, like I am so salty about that. That was my most big brain move ever. Imagine running into a demon that breaks... Be re exactly! Exactly! Anyway. Anyway. I'm not... I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna... Look, I'm not gonna rant. I'm not gonna rant. That happened. Don't do that. Just don't do that. That's that's not even an anime tip. That's just a general DM tip. 
is like let your players enjoy their victories, right? If you haven't foreshadowed, see what you guys said about foreshadowing is a great, great tip. If you haven't foreshadowed something, right? Even if let's say I have a dragon, if I have a dragon that's Im like immune to acid, right? If you got to hint at it somehow, right? Okay, fair enough if your players don't catch on. Haha, <laughs> how to DM someone? Oof, say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can teach you how to DM someone if you want. The trick is to DM them a lot and then suddenly reel back and basically make them come to you. It's like fishing. So you go in, you present the bait, and then you reel it back. And then you and then you get them to follow the bait. You get them to get closer and closer and closer to you. And then you and then when they're close enough, then you initiate the next step. You watch a movie, you hop into a Discord call, you do more. Uh DMing someone is about is like fishing. There you go, Sarah. Are you happy? Are you happy? Is that what you wanted? Is that what you wanted? If it is, please like this video. Uh, <laughs> but back to anime. So here's the first three episodes, right? Here's the first three episodes. So let's go over this really quick. Number one, slowly add character. Uh, no, number one, don't start with overcomplicated lore. You have three episodes. Make sure they know what they're after. Slowly add complexity as the story progresses. So in this case, how I added complexity was making was interlocking all of the stories. The complexity came from the fact that each one of my players' stories are intrinsically linked. So that's how I've done it. There's other things such as the, for example, then I've I've alluded to the new god being evil. I've alluded to the fact that the goddess and the new god used to be the same person. Right? So I foreshadowed this, like you guys said. Um, never make your characters feel insignificant. Your characters are the main characters. Make sure they feel like it. But at the same time, don't make them feel like the entire world revolves around them. Make sure there's consequence. If they murder a town, there's going to be consequences, right? Send your characters to jail. It's fun. Most, most players enjoy jailbreak se sessions, right? But make sure that when they do get out of jail, there's still a consequence. Like, there scene needs to be, like, a genuine consequence. For example, in the game that I use, a uh, system I use called Shadow of the Demon Lord, you get what's called a corruption point for doing something, like, intrinsically evil. And corruption points just, just mess you up in different ways. Have you ever had a player? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, min-maxers. Min-maxers are always a thing. Uh, min-maxers. You know what? Yeah. Okay, chat. What? I'm going to ask you a question. Before I go into questions and answers... Um, would you guys like me to do a part two of this series where I cover the next episodes of the anime? Because I've done episodes one to three here. And if you guys want, I'll open up a Q&A and we can talk general D&D. And then uh, in, f in future, maybe next week, we can do part two of this uh, where we will talk about... Um, we'll talk about things like uh, episodes four to six. Um... Would you guys would you guys like that or do you want me to keep going uh, explaining the different aspects of of D&D? Cuz I don't mind answering your guys questions about like my previous experiences as a, as a DM. Um I'll also make sure to, I'll also take notes of all the questions. I also really like this background that I made. I'm I'm pretty proud of it. Pretty pretty damn proud of it. Boop. Questions and answers. Q and questions and answers. Um, but yeah, all right. Let's let's do some Q and A, and then we'll we'll see how. It's interesting hearing how D and D works. Okay, cool. So we'll do some questions and answers. Then we'll do some questions and answers, uh, and then what we'll do is in future, uh, we will do we will do a part two of this. Where we'll go over developing the story further as as time goes on, and it makes sense. It'll make sense because my current campaign is on episode four. So I guess when my current campaign hits episode six, uh, then we'll do episodes three to six or four to six, right? All right, let's go. Questions and answers. The first question we have is: uh, Have you ever had a player that's tried to cheat the system? Uh, short answer: Many times, many many times. Min maxers. Min-maxers are somewhat the bane of a of a dungeon master's uh, existence if you don't know how to handle them right. If you know how to handle them right, they're going to be your best friends. 
I've had players who have tried to cheat the system by um, looking for these really obscure loopholes. Really obscure loopholes. Like, oh, um, it says if there's an ally nearby, then I'll get flanking. Then I'll get a flanking bonus. So what they do is they would use a spell like Magic Hand to summon a hand behind the enemy. And that hand would technically be counted as an ally, which would prev which would allow for a flank. Uh, which was... Okay, obviously flank is a common thing, but in this case it was homebrew because it wasn't part of the system we were playing. How did I handle that? Well, firstly... I told I, I got them to understand why the mechanic is there. The reason you get flanking bonus is because the enemy now has to watch two angles. So he's distracted, his attention is split. You get flanking bonus. A flanking bonus to your attack. Because he he isn't able to dodge you properly because he's watching the thing behind you. When it came to the magic hand, what I did is the enemy fell for it once. Right? Because it's like, oh, there's a hand. But when it realized that the hand couldn't actually attack it, it just ignored the hand. So there was no more flanking bonus. And the players started getting all up in arms like, oh, do you know that's not fair? This is what it is. This is what it is. And I was like, hey, look. Think about it rationally. If you were the enemy and this happened to you, it wouldn't catch up a card. And on top of that, that means that the enemy could do the exact same to you. The enemy could like whistle and keep in mind, the enemy has a lot more resources than you do. The enemy could literally whistle, and a rat could run behind you. And suddenly the enemy is flanking bonus. And is that really what you want? And then he was like, okay, fair. I guess not. Right, so the best thing to do is if a player is trying to cheat the system, you need to ask them. You need to tell them. You need to sit down and explain them why. Because the rules in D&D aren't, they're not set in stone. They're fair. But they're not set in stone. It's up to you as the DM to interpret them. And your players need to understand that. Your players need to... Un but your players also need to understand that you're not out to get them. You're not out to kill them. You're not against them. Right? It shouldn't be a player versus DM situation. It should never be that. It should be you trying to facilitate a good damn story. Your player's story. And when your players understand that, usually, for the most part, they, they won't really... Like, min-maxing is fine, right? Because people want to do the most damage. But I find the best thing to do in that case is uh, hide your enemy HP. Hide your enemy HP. Tell, tell your players when it's bloody... That doesn't mean change the enemy HP. Don't do that unless it's an absolute emergency or unless there's something else. But hide your enemy HP because... When your players see that, oh, the enemy has like 20 HP left. Players are going to naturally want to maximize their damage. They're going to naturally want to min-max. Um, so that's why I don't tell people how much HP my enemies have left. I tell them when they're bloodied. That means when they're at half HP. But that's all. And that way players also don't feel bad when they're not doing as much damage as the other guy. Um, they just need to... If you hide the health, it makes it more of a team experience. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, that's 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 my advice on that. If a player ever tries to cheat the system, uh, hide hide the HP bar. Make sure that they understand why mechanics are the way they are and why what they're doing doesn't work. You know. Um, now let's see. Can you say that the world is magic, and it causes all kinds of different effects? So they know it's complex. Yes. 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 Um, this is, yeah, I would say yes to that. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as, as long as you're not talking about numbers, as long as you don't bring numbers into it, do whatever you want. Here's, here's, here's the question from Rusty. Uh, after the world, you say that the world is magic. Can you say that the world has magic? This is, this in, in, in response to anime, uh, specifically anime, uh, worlds. So can you say, wait. Can you say that the world has magic and that it causes all kinds of different effects? So know, yes. So as long as they know that, as long as they know that the world itself is unstable, uh, but make sure you create that in confines, right? So give them examples. Be like, the world has magic and it causes different effects. 
So, for example, 10 years ago, the moon turned red, and that caused all of the water in the land to turn to blood. Another 10 years ago, the mountains began to liquefy and melt, flooding entire villages before eventually hardening. Right? Let them know. Make sure that let them know the limits of this so that it's not just, oh, the world is magic. Cool. And then suddenly they find out that the floor is now lava. Right? Without those previous two examples, that's going to be weird. But just literally giving them two examples, suddenly it's expected. The players will openly try to overcome that because they're not hit by that shock factor. Um, adding complex something complex like alchemy will make it a bit too OP. You see, once again, as a DM, you control what alchemy is. You define what alchemy is. If you wanted to, you could. I have, for, for example, my campaign right now, I could add alchemy right now and it wouldn't affect it wouldn't... Uh, oh, thank you, Kimberly. It wouldn't actually affect the campaign that much. The world is stable enough that I could add that. And I, I am confident enough in my abilities as a DM to bounce it quite pretty easily. Um, you know, equivalent exchange, for example. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. Let's go go to the next question. The next question is, have you had an OP NPC player? that, um, Or do you think it's bad for... Uh, it's... Okay, not... NPCs, okay, NPCs are NPCs. Make sure when they are OP that there's a reason for it. OP players, yes. Uh, it is bad for the game if one of your players becomes too overpowered, but that won't happen if you're sticking to the rules. And it'll usually only happen if you... Um, it'll usually happen uh, if the DM messes with messes with things or misinterprets stuff. Once again, it, in this case, it's usually the DM's fault. Um, like, an overpowered player is a problem because it makes everyone else feel insignificant. It makes everybody else feel crap. Right? How I counteract that. For example, we have mechs in the party. Mechs does crazy amounts of damage. He's a clockwork. He's a giant robot. Well, he's not giant. He's a small robot. But he's a very strong robot. And if I handled that wrong, my players could very easily feel like they don't matter in battles. So what do I do instead? I do things like when one player attacks the boss. Yo, Jono, welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for the raid. Uno reverse raid? Oh my gosh. Yo, thank you so much. Guys, make sure you check out Jono. Jono is a super, super awesome friend of mine. Uh, can we get a shout out? Can we get an exclamation mark Jono? Chat, can you spam exclamation mark Jono in chat? Can we get an exclamation mark Jono spammed in chat while I look for while I look for um something to show you guys? <laughs> Here we go. Let's let's find uh let's find something. Let's find let's find let's find some cringe. Wait, actually, do I have any do I have any clips for uh do I have any clips for jo of Jono? Yes, I do. Okay, chat. Here you go. You raid me, I raid you back. I appreciate it. When I hit a hundred thousand subscribers, Nick, I promise you, I will get a swim. I will get a swimsuit Jono model made. <laughs> the question is, will it be a swimsuit or a speedo <laughs> or a bikini? <laughs> oh God, you're bye. <laughs> Woo, chat. Make sure he never forgets that. All right. Make sure he never, ever, ever forgets that. I'm, <laughs> all right, all right, chat. Make sure you never let this man live this down. All right, all right. Do I have your promises, right? Do I have your, do I have, do I have, do I have a promise in chat? Clip that. Oh, it is clipped. Look, it's right here. It's right here. It's clipped. It's clipped because <laughs> right here. <laughs> Would I? Do you guys want to link to the clip? Sure. Jono, thank you so much for the raid. Time to private that video. Quick, quick, record it. Screen record it. Hit 100,000 subscribers, Nick. I promise you I will get a swim... I will get a swimsuit Jono model made. I will get a swimsuit <laughs> Jono model made. I love this guy. I love this guy. Guys, make sure you check out Jono. Like, he's actually... A, he's an amazing friend of mine. And we're playing Halo next week. Let's go. Let's go. Um. So stay tuned for that. Thank you again for the raid, Jono. Much appreciated. Jono is also a big D&D &D player. Um, so, 
if you guys if you guys are interested. Oh, do you want it this week, Jono? Jono, we could do it this week. Jono, hey, you want you want to you want to play this week? I'm I'm uh, I I don't think I'm doing anything Saturday. Am I doing anything Saturday? Or Saturday night? I thought it was this Saturday. Um, wait, let me um. Let me get back to you. I might be able to. I might be able to do this Saturday, Jonah. Because I'd rather do it this Saturday, to be honest. King, thank you so much for the super chat. And Jonah, once again, thank you so much for the raid. All right. Um, for for people who have just joined, um, my name is Frey. I'm Ramalse Sensei. Hopefully, I can earn you a. Uh, hopefully, I can earn a like and subscription from you guys this day. Sorry, it's only a dollar. No worries. Um, what we're doing is we're. Oh my gosh, gamer plays. Thank you so much for the dollar. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? A present? Oh Funny. God. Oh God. But you're a student. Oh I'm, God. I'm a teacher. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Hmm. Hmm. So, thanks to this special person, no one gets any homework today. But you're gonna get double tomorrow. Yeah, damn right you guys are. Just so you know. Damn right you guys are. Anyway, so. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, I'm a long-time dungeon master. I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons for upwards of seven years. I've been DMing for six years. And I've been role-playing for a total of 12 years now. Isn't that crazy? It's not crazy. I've been role-playing for 12 years. Um, and what I'm doing right now is I'm giving people uh, the opportunity. I'm showing people how to create an anime world. I'm also a weeb. I have over 350 anime series watched. What does that mean? It means I'm really damn good at creating anime-themed world. Uh, Jono actually did as well. Jono actually created a Naruto campaign, which, um, from what I hear, I've heard a lot about it, and I'm actually using it as inspiration for a few new systems that I'm developing for my current campaign, which is the Isekai TTRPG, which takes place this Saturday at 2 p.m. So stay tuned for that. That's fun. But yeah. Let's go over what we went over before. Let's go over. We're just doing Q&As because we we're ba we basically just finished the main tutorial uh, side. Um, but for creating an anime world, just a quick recap. The first step. Don't don't start with overcomplicated lore. Keep the lore concise. Make sure the players know why they're there. Make sure they know what's happening. We are we going to check on the demon child? No worries at all, king. Um, have you ever watched certain magical index? Uh, I'm watching it. I'm 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 on like episode one. I, I'm literally in, I'm watching it right now. Actually, um, make sure your characters never feel insignificant because they are main characters. But at the same time, make sure that the world doesn't stop moving around them. Make sure the story revolves around them, but not the world. That's a careful balance. That is a very careful balance that you need to maintain. Make sure the story revolves around them, but the world does not. The world keeps moving, things happen, their decisions and their stuff impacts the world, even if they're not around. Remember that. But at the same time, make sure that the story revolves around them. Secondly, slowly add complexity as the story progresses, but only when you feel like your players have already gotten used to the... They've already wrapped their heads around your initial lore. So, for example, take Attack on Titan. What's a great... What's a great... um. It's a great uh, example, right? You're introduced to the world, you're introduced to the story, you're introduced to the plot, and the moment that they that we all start to become familiar with that plot, uh, bam, the basement happens. If you guys don't know what's in the basement, I'm not going to spoil it. Go watch Attack on Titan. <laughs> um, focus on a handful of key characters. That's very important. Don't bombard your characters with too too many characters. Think about anime. Think think about think about every good anime you've seen and ask ask yourself how many characters are actually in that anime that you can remember, and that should be your that should be your keyframe. Thirdly. Try to set up one-on-one one, -on -one, one shots with each player. It'll allow them to be to sort of engross themselves in the story. It'll allow them to get to know their characters. It'll allow them to understand why their characters in the world. That prevents things like murder hoboing. It prevents it it, it drastically reduces the chance of derailing. Um, because the players want to know more about their character. Uh, what would be the limit to focusing on characters? Um uh, what would be the ling limit to focusing on characters? I guess the I guess one thing would be here. Look, let me let me add that to the Q and A section. So let's copy and paste this. 
Um, gotta head off to sleep. Work tomorrow? No worries at all, Jono. Thanks again for the raid. I really, really appreciate it. I really, really, really appreciate it. And Jono, we gotta play D&D &D sometime. Alright? We gotta play D&D &D sometime. Uh, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. <laughs> I would love I would love to get a chance to play D&D &D with you at some point, Jono. And I will see you hopefully this Saturday. Uh, I will message you the details on whether or whether or not I can do Saturday. I Because I need to double check. I might have another collab. But once again, guys, check out Jono Kim again. Exclamation mark Jono in chat again. Once again, exclamation mark Jono. Uh, if you guys haven't already, here, look. Exclamation mark Jono. No, that's a one. Exclamation mark Jono. Make sure you check him out. Super awesome friend of mine. Super close friend of mine. Uh, amazing guy. Amazing streamer. Uh, you guys will love what he does. Now, what would they limit to focusing on characters? So, you know you're focusing on the characters too much when the world starts to warp around them straight away right the the main villain here's my here's my biggest advice the main villain's goal in life shouldn't be to kill your characters your character's goal should be to stop the villain from doing what he initially wanted to do your players are pulling themselves into the story your story is enforcing itself on the players. That's what I mean. That's uh, that's one example. Another example is, let's say your players visit a town and they do a bunch, but suddenly, and then they have to leave. That town shouldn't just stop functioning. The people in those towns shouldn't just disappear that your party should hear whispers of things about the town. They should hear rumors. Maybe they should revisit that town. Maybe one of the characters from the town comes to visit them wherever they are. The world needs to feel alive. Sword Art Online, with all its flaws, love it or hate it, season one, Kirito was doing his business and doing his thing while the people, while the top players were still pushing for higher and higher floors. They were still doing that People were still living their daily lives. People were buying houses, setting up shops. They were doing their things while Kirito was doing his. That's what I mean. The world needs to keep on moving. Needs to keep on chugging. That's 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 what I mean. Like the limit to focusing on characters is when too many plot lines revolve around the character. Basically. It'll be forever, Arkham. Let's go. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I guess that's the limit. Um, now, there was another question about OP characters. Now, OP characters, yes, they, they, they ruin the story. They ruin the story if they're not managed properly. You need to understand that there's different... D&D &D isn't just about doing damage. It's not about doing damage. It's not about doing damage. It's about having fun with your friends. And you need to reward them for stuff. You need to reward players for using their heads. If a player isn't good at dealing damage, reward them for being a distraction. But make sure they're not stuck in the distraction role. They're a distraction now, and they put their lives on the line. So reward them for that. Give them a new weapon. Give them a new spell. Give them a new magical item. Give them something that allowed them to play the game the way that they want. Um, how to deal with OP characters. You very rarely, you very rarely want to nerf the OP character. Very rarely. But if you do, there has to be reason for it. There has to be reason for it. For example, the character has a very OP sword. That sword needs to be, that sword needs to... I know, let's say something like you need, let, for example, he's got this OP sword. They're fighting a really hard enemy. And the enemy is about to kill one of their friends with this huge energy blast. That player now has the option to use his sword. Make sure you hint at it first. But like that the sword can like deflect energy blast, but, but so, suffer severe damage as a result. And this guy now knows that if I want to save my friend, I need to sacrifice my magic sword. Then, uh, he jumps in the way. He shields the friend with his sword. Um, 
the sword breaks. Don't just leave him there, right? The sword breaks, but now, um, let's say, let's say, um, you're both filled with power. You feel the determination. The the power that was held in the sword ebbs and flows, and it fills the room. It permeates the air. It fills you all with determination. <laughs> And basically what happens is they level up. Let the characters level up. Bam. He sacrificed his sword, but now now the entire party levels up. Do you get what I mean? Make sure there's make sure you're always balancing. You're always ma you're making sure that every sacrifice has a, has a silver lining. Um would it be fair for the NPCs to match the OP character strength? No. No, because if you do that, you are going to suffer from what's called power creep, right? If you if you keep bumping up power over and over again without, um, what do you call it? You start to suffer from power creep, and suddenly the weaker characters feel even weaker. And now I have popcorn and water. Oh, nice! But like I said, um, yes, he does rust. Oh wait, what happened to rust? Um. Oh, does Jonah have a Discord server? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonah does. Um, big, uh, we got a link to Jonah's server. I'll send. I'll send a link to Jonah's server. Uh, it's called. It's. It's the gate. Here it is. Sorry's gate. Uh, invite people. Copy. Uh, and here you go, chat. That's Jonah's server. But uh, when it comes to NPCs, uh, it starts to make the weak characters feel even weaker. If you want a direct answer, if there's one character who does a lot of single target damage, add more horde encounters. Uh, if the character does too much AoE damage, you put up enemies that resist that 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 particular type of damage, but don't target that char character either. Like I said, these are short term, go short term solutions. You need those long term solutions. Like I said, like um, he has to break the sword. I remember doing something like this when I was in D and D campaign. It's based off. Uh, on I grow stronger the more I eat. Oh, that's cool. So that's cool. That is really cool. I like that. I like that. But yeah. So, when it comes to OP characters, you need to understand why they're bad for the campaign. They're bad for the campaign because the other characters feel insignificant. And what you're trying to remedy isn't... You're not trying to... F it's not about the DM. It's not about, all oh, the characters killing my monsters too fast. No. The main issue with OP characters is that the other characters, the other players feel insignificant. And that's what you got to focus on if you want your players to have fun. Um, but yeah. I guess that's a really... I, I, I guess that's a really... Yo, hey, Kataro. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I, I guess that's... Yeah, that, that basically wraps that up nicely. Does anyone else have any other questions regarding DD? I, I remember there was another. I think I think uh, DN had, had a question for me before. Um, let's see if I can remember it. But yeah, as we're going, guys, if you're if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to like the video. It does really, really, really well for the algorithm. Um, Susan really likes it when she sees people liking my videos. Ooh, woo. And I'm trying to impress Susan Chan. And if you haven't already, make sure to leave a subscription. Uh, leave a comment, even. If you guys really like it, leave a comment. Remember, we're trying to please Susan Chan. We're trying to make Susan Chan notice me. Um, but let's see. Let's see. Where's So the story will be set. I remember there was a question up here, but I need to find it. The player trying to cheat the system. It's before this. Uh, 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 uh. Um, what's the best D&D &D experience you have? That was it. That was a good one. Um... The best D&D experience I had was definitely my JoJo's RPG. My JoJo's TTRPG was hands down the greatest D&D experience that I've ever had. Hands down. Hands down without question. Why? Well, actually, it's actually really cool. It's a really, really funny little, little story there. Well, for one, it's JoJo's. <laughs> it's, it's JoJo's. Right? But secondly, the players used their head. And I was able to reward that. My players were the kind of players who enjoyed 
Jojo style villains. Villains that were more puzzles than enemies. They had to understand what the p villain's motives were. They had to understand what the villain's powers were while simultaneously trying to hide their own powers from the villain. The players worked together. They used their heads. They, um, they used, they pulled all their knowledge together to fight the enemies. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, yeah. Um, it was called Jojo's, it was, it was called, uh, Jojo, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Raspberry, Raspberry Barrel, um, which is a, which is a, um, Prince song. So yeah, that's how you know, that's how you know. Um, and basically, like, like one one amazing example was um, what was one of the what was one of the enemies that they killed? Oh no, I won't go into it. It'll take too long. Uh, what stand powers? Uh, we had it wasn't me, the hamster, who was uh, hidden jam. If you see him in chat, he was a hamster. Uh, he had the ability to his stand looked like a giant cactus, and had the ability to shoot it out its spines, and then switch places with anything that it's any living thing that its spine touched no anything that its spine touched uh, that was smaller than a certain diameter so if so if he if his spine if he used if his spine hit like a car no no car was too big if his spine hit like like a uh like a can he could swap places with a can yo what's up lick how are you doing welcome to the stream welcome 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 um or a fridge yeah you could switch places with the fridge uh, and the other one was uh, TNT. Uh, TNT had the ability to um, multiply the f multiply and reflect any force exerted on his fists. So he could. So if you punched him and he punched your fist with his fist specifically, um, he could nullify your punch and then send it back at you at one point five percent strength um but he was really fragile everywhere else in his body we had wolf tones uh the ability to uh it was a it was basically a giant whip it was a giant bandage that he used to uh he would wrap it around a surface and use it like a giant harp uh and then he would be able to pluck the strings and shoot forward these little air these little um air pockets that when they would hit things would cause things to implode, but like just within a certain, just within like the space of like a like a soccer ball. Um, we also had Aki Breaky. Uh, he had the ability to he had the ability to punch something and revert it into its most basic elements, uh, similar to Crazy Diamond but more scientific. And um, what was the third one? There was I'm missing someone. No, I think that was everyone. That was everyone. Oh, yes. Um, Aki Breaky eventually got the ability to reconstruct those things. Uh, and Wolf Tones, uh, his his brain was... his. He was able to unlock his stand's full potential, which allowed him to uh, cause things to explode when he punched them. Uh, the main villain had the stand Aftermath, which, which had the ability of time suspension. He could touch something and suspend an instance of it in time. And then replay that instance. So an example was when he was running across the road and he touched a car that was about to hit him and it seemed to phase through him. And then when um, Jimothy Joestar tried to run after him, the he sort of clicked his fingers and suddenly Jimothy was hit with the force of the car that he had suspended in time. It had the secondary effect, because it's a villain and he needs a secondary effect, of if the instance touches any part of the original, that entire thing would revert back in time. So had that instance hit any part of that car, the entire car would have reverted back and appeared where it was about to hit the villain. So yeah, um, I love making D&D campaigns that work with intellect rather than plain combat. Yeah, exact same. 100%, same. All my D&D campaigns require my, require my party to use their heads. I designed my battles like a puzzle. And I don't have a set way for them to beat it. They just need to use their heads. And like all I know is in my head is like they've got like a 50% chance of beating this enemy. That's how I, I, I rate it. I don't rate it based on difficulty. I rate it on the percentage that they're likely to survive. Any good sad moments? Um, in D&D? 
I mean, I, I did I did tell you about... Oh, yeah, here's one. Okay, you ready? You ready? I'm going to set the scene. I'm going to set the scene. You ready for this? Did my character Zeal? He wasn't known... He wasn't known for being a particular... He wasn't known for being particularly bright. Um, but he loved his friends. He adored his friends. And... Oh, Overload. Overlord, that's really that's really fun. Um, so he was captured because I had to go on holidays, so I was gone for a month. Uh, and in that time, my character was basically captured and tortured. And the other players were there because the other players I knew for a fact that they didn't even try to look for me once. So I decided I would hit them hard in the fields. I was a player, by the way. And my, my DM immediately knew what I was doing. So this person comes over and says, So, what are we today? Which finger do we break? Which, which uh, organ do we pierce? How do I make you scream today? And then my character goes, Um... I'd I'd rather I'd rather not either. Um, please. Um, I I I want to go home. And like the other players were listening, by the way, obviously. And so the person goes, so the DM goes, "You're not going home. You're not going home ever. You're not going to see anyone that you care about ever again." And so I went, that's, no, that's not true. And he was like, what do you mean? Well, I know they're coming to look for me. They're going to find me soon. Did you hear from them? Did you hear of these brave adventurers? I'm sure they're close. I just need to hold out for a bit longer. I know my friends would never forget me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so basically, yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, that was uh, that was uh, that was uh, that was me. That was me getting back at them for forgetting me. Um, but yeah, long story short, uh, yeah, I hit them with a big, big fat chunk of guilt right across their face. Sounds like Fluencia. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my character was kind of an idiot. It was like one of his one of his famous quotes was. So I went to school. Turns out it was Crusader camp. And I thought it was school. But it was in school. And instead of teaching me how to take 5 from 10, all they taught me was how to take Jerusalem. <laughs> I freaking love Zeo. Zeo is one of my favorite characters. He was part of the campaign that... That campaign lasted two years. What was the reaction? No one made eye contact. Everyone, everyone was avoiding eye contact with me until they actually came to rescue me. Um, but yeah, no, I freaking loved Zeo. Zeo was one of my Zeo. Zeo's my baby. Um, like oh my gosh, and then he came out with that with like severe PTSD uh, when he was when he was eventually rescued, and he eventually developed like a split personality. One of them was like the inside him was like the personality of the person who tortured him. And and obviously his own goofy personality. So it's a, it's a cool bit of character development. I, I wasn't I wasn't opposed to that. Um, there is also the sad moment when I did the Made in Abyss campaign, when um, when my friend's lover was killed, uh, saving him. But it was a really cool thing because what it is he put. Like a crown. I, don't, I won't go into it. It was sad. It was sad. But yeah. Two of my three campaigns are still going on after three years. That's awesome, gamer. That's awesome. Like, honestly, I love it when um campaigns go on for long times. It shows that the players are dedicated. Um, I can't always do that, unfortunately. Um, But yeah, so what I do usually with my with my players is I'll go, we'll do, we'll, we'll do one. Because my anime are, my, my um campaigns are usually anime-based. Anime and so I usually ask my players uh, if they want to continue or not. 
and it's like yes or no. It's like if they don't want to continue, then we um, you know, we stop obviously. Um, but but yeah, I know, chap. I feel like I feel like. Does anybody else have any other questions regarding an regarding anime themed world specifically, or or things cons uh, about my own personal experiences as a DM? Uh, yeah, like uh, I will I will answer anything. If not, we'll end the stream. I'm I'll look for someone to raid. I wonder who we could raid though. Depends on who's in my redirect. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see who's in my subscription list. And we'll see if there's any other. While I'm looking for this, feel free to send in your questions. And once again, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I'll be sure to do more. And we'll even be playing some. We will even be playing some. Oh, wait. Let me just double check. What time is Noir streaming? Or is Nick streaming? Nico Dracos. If, if Nick's streaming soon, then I will raid Nick. But I don't know. Um, let me see. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll ask him something. Is anyone anyone streaming soon, so I can send my viewers over? Okay, there we go. I just asked. Uh, I just asked in the chat. Uh, how much skill do you think you have as a DM? I can confidently say that I was one of the best DMs on my campus. Um, 100% easily. Um, I have many years as a DM. And I also have many years as a... Um, basically basically psychoanalyzing people and i have even more years as a weeb um the things that i can do in the, as a dm most people can't and now it's not impossible glad i was able to uh, uh, attend the entire stream oh I, I appreciate that um and yet obviously people can learn to do what i do but what i do, but i'm a, but i'm a damn good dm and i will stand by that and you can ask any one of my players you can, I can confidently say you can ask any one of my players and they will say the same. <laughs> but let's see. Let's see. Where is this? Uh, we get together every two months. We mostly do the campaign based off. I get stronger the more I eat and Overlord. Anytime a new volume comes out. Ooh, I like that. I like that. I think that's really cute. I think that's really cool. How since you're... Since you're um, since your campaign is based off Overlord, then like the more Overlords things come out, the more lore you guys have to work with. I really like that. Um, that's a really cool concept. Maybe I'd, I'd like to try that one day. I would like to try that one day. I think that would be really, really fun. Uh, one of the... Uh, I want to do a Black Clover. I want to do a Black Clover campaign one day. I Because I really like Black Clover. And I would love... I would love, love, love to do a Black Clover campaign. Um... Let's see. Uh, let's see. Wait, wait, really quick. He ask him if he's going live, so I can wait. Wait, I will. Um, let me see. I'm because I know Nick was going live. I just want to know what time. Hey Nick, you going live soon? I can raid you. Okay, I'm, I'm there. I just messaged Nick because I think Nick Nick said he was going live, and I, I do want to read best DM cops. Thank you, thank you, Nick. <laughs> uh, you want a screaming campaign? What does that mean? Will you be able to get into? Will I be? Will we be able to get into D and D sessions with you? Um, it really depends, Dan. It really depends, because you know what I mean. It's like, it's like if I do, then who do I choose? It's one of those things where it's just like that's the thing with that's the thing with VTubers. It's like the reason we don't have. The reason we don't have our DMs open, the reason you can't just DM a VTuber is because if we started, like, allowing one person, like, everyone would want to, and then and then it's like, where do we draw the line, right? 
and then how do we choose? How do we choose who we talk to? And then and then it just leads into favoritism. And then and then like viewers just start to feel left out. And you know what I mean? That's a problem. Because Asa's screams have forever defined Black Clover. Honestly. Honestly, I I I wouldn't mind. I would love that. I would love that. I love Black Clover. <laughs> Our overlay campaign, we fought the theocracy last week. See, okay, I will say I'm not caught up at all in Overlord. I dropped Overlord at the start of second second season because I wasn't interested in the lizard sex. <laughs> I I just wasn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. And thank you, Nyx. Thank you for thinking I'm the best DM. I appreciate that. And Nyx has played D&D &D before. I'm just going to say that. He did, but that's what made him that's what made him great. He was just a little screamy boy. He was just, he was just a little screamy boy. Up to date my resting day stream. God damn it, Nyx are spotting. All right. The lizard Okay, they were funny. But I just didn't, I just didn't care like like I just I just didn't. Um I wanted like, I dropped that enemy so hard because, yeah, like, literally, like, I, I just, I just, I, maybe I'll give another shot. Maybe I need to rewatch season one and then, and then just skip. Because I made it to the end of that plot, right? I made it to the end of that plot line. I didn't just drop it because of the lizard sex. I made it all the way to the end of the lizard sex and then dropped it. Um, take that as you will. Please, nobody clip that. Nobody clip that. I swear to God. Um... The third season, and then you one are the best. Okay, maybe I'll give it a shot. Maybe I will give it a shot. Nick hasn't responded. Uh, I'll have to. I'll have to raid someone else, chat. I'll have to raid someone else. Um, if he asks, just let him know we tried. <laughs> All right. What do you think it was the worst and best anime? Um, that you dropped. The the what? What do you think was the worst anime that you watched slash dropped so fast? Um, I don't. I don't drop anime. I kind of watch all anime. How to pick up... Is it wrong to pick up girls in dungeon? I, I like that anime. I liked it because Hestia was cute. Remember, Chad, I'm a simple man with simple pleasure. I like world development. And part of world development is how developed the fan service is. So if it's got decent world development and fan service, I will watch it. Which is the majority of anime. Uh, my anime list. Let's check, let's check my anime list, chat. Let us check my anime list. Okay, let's not... Let's let's maybe not uh, show you my password. Uh, I'll log in very quick, and then and then I will show you my my anime list. Let's let's check let's check the things that I've dropped. This isn't I haven't updated this in like months by the way. So I'm now at like 350 360 anime. Um, let's see what are the anime I've dropped. Okay, so this one just bored me. I was just bored. This one also bored me. It had good fan service. It just bored me. This one didn't feel like anime. There was something off about it that it just didn't feel like anime and I didn't like it. This one looked amazing. It was so pretty, but it was boring. And not enough fan service. This one, honestly, I'm, 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 I plan to watch it. It's cute. It's an anime about girls making cups. I'll, I, I will watch it. I will, I, I'll take it off this list. It doesn't deserve to be on this list. This one, uh, just not enough fan service, chat. It had good. Actually, no, I think, no, I think I just dropped it because I, I got confused. You know what? I'll, p I'll put it on plan to watch. I'll put it back on plan to watch. I, I don't think it deserves to be on that one. Um. But yeah, yeah. I don't really drop anime. My my standard in anime is is extremely low. <laughs> it it is it is very like it is so low. But anyway, let's let's look for some raid. Let's look for some raid. I'm getting I'm getting distracted again. I'm getting too distracted. Um Let's see. Who do we raid? Who do we raid? I mean, let's go raid. Let's go raid Pam. Have we raided Pam this week? I don't think we have. I don't think we've raided Pam this week. But chat, remember, we're going to... We're going to hit her with that Faisal Sesa raid, all right? 
So make sure she knows who sent you. Thank you so much to everybody for coming today. Make sure if you haven't already, like and subscribe. But hey, Frey, look at the anime openings for Overload. Are the new ones? Okay, I will. I'll have to do it after stream because copyright. Don't want to get bonked by Susan too hard. Um, but yeah, let's go. Let's go raid Pam. Let's sing our ending song first. Actually, you know what? Let's sing. Let's sing a D and D theme song. Let's, uh, I'm gonna treat you guys. You guys sat through listening to me. You guys listened to me babbling on about my experiences as a DM for long enough that I think you guys deserve a decent song. Let's sing "I See Fire" by Ed Sheeran. Let's sing. Let's sing "I See Fire" by Ed Sheeran. Let's. I'll. I'll be nice. I will. I will reward you guys for sitting through my my boring lecture. Um. Here we go. Check one, two. Check, 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 check. All right, here we go. Da, 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 da. Oh, this eye of the mountain below. Keep careful watch on my brother's souls. And should the sky be filled with Fire and smoke Keep careful watch over your son Can we get some fire in the chat? This is the song written for The Hobbit Which I believe has a lot of like D&D stuff If this is the end in fire Then we should all burn together Watch the flames climb high into the night Calling out Father O oh, Stand by and we will watch the flames burn all burn on the mountain side Whoa <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming to the stream today And if we should die tonight then we should all die together Raise a glass of wine For the last time Calling out Father O oh, Prepare as we will Watch the flames burn or burn on The mountainside Desolation comes upon the sky Now I see fire Inside the mountains I see fire Burning the trees I see fire Hollowing souls I see fire Blood in the breeze And I hope that you'll remember me Whew! God! That's emotional. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, should my people fall, then surely I'll do the same. Confined in mountain halls, we got too close to the flame. Calling out, Father, oh, hold fast and we will watch the flames burn, oh, burn on mountainside desolation comes upon the sky here we go now i see fire inside the mountain i see fire burning the trees i see fire I hope that you remember me And if the night is burning I will cover my eyes Cause if the dark returns Then my brothers will die And as the sky is falling down It crashed into this lonely town And with the shadow on the ground I hear but people screaming now I see fire 
inside the mountain, I see fire burning the trees. I see fire hollowing souls. I see fire blood in the breeze. Yes, I see fire. Yes, I see fire. Yes, I see fire. I see fire burning up and on the mountainside. Woo! All right, chat. And that was I See Fire by Ed Sheeran. It's a very, I know, that song puts me in the mood for D&D every single time. I don't know about you guys, definitely a D&D &D answer for me. All right, let's go raid Pam. Remember, exclamation mark, remember, phrase soul says to raid in Pam's chat, all right? Make sure you hit her with that. Make sure she knows who sent you guys. Here we go. Goodbye now. <laughs>